Welcome all of you to this live program, Dalpuri Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Mehdi Siala from Nice, France. Dr. Siala completed his medical education in Paris, France, following which he joined orthopedic residency in Toulouse, southwest of France, and later subspecialized in upper limb surgery. Subsequently, he completed a fellowship in hand surgery with Dr. Mark Garcia Elias. He worked as a senior consultant in traumatology and upper limb surgery in the surroundings of Toulouse, southwest France from 2019 to 2022, before moving to Nice in 2023. He holds a diploma from the European Board of Hand Surgery and has several publications to his credit in his chosen field of upper limb surgery. So today it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Mehdi Siala from Nice, France. Over to you, Mehdi. Well, hello, Professor, and thank you for having me. It's a great honor to be presenting with you today. And uh, I've been short of speaking about the trapezium meticarpal dual mobility prosthetic arthroplasty. And I wanted to come back on this odyssey that's just uh, half a, a century ago, that started half a century ago. And well, uh, my presentation is going to read about that. Um, starting now. So as you can see, the thumb is a story that started a few dozens of million of years ago, and it has an amazing evolution uh, from uh, all of the ancestors we had till the primates and the homo sapiens, the actual homo sapiens. And it's a functional paradox between stability and um, mobility in this articulation, as it has to work with fine pinch and powerful grasp. And mechanical studies uh, started even in 77 by Cooney uh, said that there is an exponential increase of forces between the tip of the thumb and the CMC, the first CMC articulation by a factor 12. And this is exponential. The compression forces at the CMC can be up to 120 kilogram, which is approximately 1200 newtons. So word about biomechanics. So the articulation is a saddle joint and it's a ball and socket and circumduction. However, in close lateral pinch to the index finger or wide prehension of large objects, it's, um, it's an articulation that needs a flex that can allow a flexion extension and abduction adduction movement, but also by a composite rotation and translation of the metacarpal, a pronation and a supination movement. So this is the articulation it's always compared to a saddle. Truth is, it's a little bit more complex than that. There is different radii of curvature between the trapezium and the metacarpal. It is only congruent in the extreme motion, taking a little intrinsic stability in the bones, also due to the shallow concavity of those bones, which are the metacarpal and the trapezium. So there is a big and huge role in the stability of this articulation by the ligament and muscle surrounding it and inserting nearby. And they can afford, they, they are the reason we have stability and a bit of laxity and the proprioception by the innovation of the capsule and ligaments and all of the tendons around. It's a complex movement that has been described by LAD, amongst other, in 2013 and 2014 in two excellent articles I advise you to read if you want to know more about this. So this is the saddle we're talking about. Anatomically, it has been described uh, 300 years ago, approximately, and there is accurate description of many ligaments, but none of them is exactly reproducible. And the, having something that is reproducible is quite elusive. Some description, some description had as low as three ligaments, as other has up to 16 ligaments. As for stability, well, volar, dorsal, and ulnar ligament has been advocated to be the main stabilizer, but people are not really agreeing in this in the biomechanics field. So the ligament, they usually work to avoid the subluxation in the radial direction while grasping or pinching with the thumb and the index or the whole, uh, the whole palm. So this is the same saddle with all of the component of it. So you can see it's a quite complicated story. So there is no consensus exactly about which one is more important in the stability. We know that they are preventing shifting with load. AOL and DRL have been advocated to be the most important, but the thing is that, well, nobody really agrees. There even is a prospective trial uh, going on in Brazil since last year including patient with osteoarthritis of the CMC, the first CMC articulation, just to see if the first dorsal enterosus muscle strengthening is able to reduce pain in this population. And as I said, 
those ligaments with osteoarthritis can evolve and become lax and they allow radial subluxation during functional activity. And it has been also advocated in those studies that laxity leads to CMC osteoarthritis or at least is associated with it. So here's the one of the description that you can find about the classifications of uh, thumb CMC osteoarthritis. The most famous one, or the two most famous one, are the Eaton and Littler uh, classification that I put on X-ray and the Dell classification. The difference being the osteoarthritis of the STT joint in the last stage. So stage two and three uh, and three are the most uh, common stages where you see the patient in clinics. And they restrain the TMC and the MCP movement in space in abduction adduction, but also in pronation and suffination. And this is unaffected by sex and handedness according to the study by Hammond in 2014. Another word about the stability is uh, that the passive stability and the overall stability are linked, but not only. They are the dynamic stabilizers. And an intraoperative stable joint mean few movement in the trapezium. And I, as I put here, all the different kind of uh, deformation that can happen with arthritis, the most common one being the, the, the double saddle. Um, if you have a very stable joint in the period and um, during the surgery it's a joint that has a high potential of stiffness and merley said in 1916 uh, regarding his 39 uh, trapeziectomy at that time already that uh, that surgery of cmc arthritis usually relieved pain but with a high incidence of loss of strength and decreased range of motion and abduction and his conclusion at that time in 1960 was that this surgery should not be applied to young active people or heavy workers. So these are the X-rays that are described the Kempenji incidence and another one that's quite useful to have an idea about the progression of CMC arthritis. And what's the ideal surgery? The article for 2014 said that a good surgery should have a lot of points respected to be um, the one of the best treatment we can offer to our patient. And this list is a versatile mobility in all of the different mobilization and position that the thumb can has. Conserving the strength, conserving the precision of the opposition, and that in fine and gross motor function. And the article said that options that combine a basic science approach and clinical relevance through emulation, soft tissue reconstruction, or recreation of considering an implant arthroplasty, will constitute the ideal surgical procedure. And the article concluded that that kind of surgery doesn't exist yet. So what's very important is the versatility. And well, as we saw, the soft tissue reconstruction is quite complicated and with a lot of comorbidities that we have seen in the LRTI uh, and other surgery with uh, tendons, um, autograft tendons used uh, for filling the space after trapeziectomy. So that surgery actually did exist at that time. 1973, La Cafinière started doing the surgery. This French surgeon started uh, thinking about the CMC arthritis, or at least publish about CMC arthritis as soon as 1970. And in 1974, he published his first series. He got inspired from the hip arthroplasty. That was the most famous hip, the most famous arthroplasty uh, at that time and the most frequent one. Well, and what about the rotatory actual instability from going to um, a joint that was supposed to be a saddle to a ball and socket? Well, truth is, in practice, capsule ligamentous structure and surgical scar fibrosis gave that stability needed and, well, no rotatory actual instability appeared with the patient. However, even though the idea of digressing a bit from the anatomy, and it's not the first time in history, in surgical history, or at least not the only example we have with the reverse shoulder arthroplasty, that digressing from anatomy can sometimes, with the, uh, the operation of arthritis and the muscle surrounding, and might be use of ligament and muscle surrounding, uh, digressing from anatomy can be useful. And in 2001, De La Caffiniere published his series about 26 years of the La Caffiniere arthroplasty, and he had as high as 27% of revision. And he said that hyperextension of the MCP and thumb shortening are the reason leading to the loosening of trapezial cup, and that the modification of the metacarpal device 
would supposedly protect the MCP stability and then protect the trapezium again, the trapezial cup against the loosening. So a lot of other people got interested in this story and there is a lot of design that appeared and not only the ball and socket one, but also the, inter also the interposition, the sphere, the saddle, some being in silicon, the other in pyrocarbon, the others, uh, when there is a bearing like for the arthroplasty, the ball and socket arthroplasty, metal on metal, metal on polyethylene. Some work better than others. Some still exist. Most of those shown in the X-ray are not commercialized anymore. And then we saw that there is a high percentage of complication and revision for, with those first generation arthroplasties. People tried to think of solution with the single mobility transforming into a retentive cup because luxation was, I mean, dislocation was the first and more complex uh, and more um, initial uh, revision reason in the in the first uh, generation of thoplasty. Then came the double mobility and the conical cup and the screwed cup. Well, we're coming to that. Proof is that in 1990, um, Conte in Lyon, uh, got inspired with the Caffinia arthroplasty and created a modular system. A stem that was anatomical and cemented, a cup that was also uncemented, and with anatomic stems, uh, with neck angulations. That was the new introduced thing. And De La Caffiniere got interested by that. And, well, he developed his second generation that was also modular, the straight neck, however, and he declared better range of motion than his first version. In parallel to that, Bouchon in Nancy created the reverse Rubis. He got inspired by the, he got inspired or parallel at least to the reverse arthroplasty in the shoulder. Well, a final touch, big major event that came is the dual mobility. It has been described by Christians in 1969. However, it has been developed and um, popularized in hip arthroplasty by Gilles Bousquet in 1976. First trial and successful trial in 1977. And this concept came with new arthroplasties. So the first one was in 2010, the movies, followed closely by the touch and the Maya that existed, but did not get a double uh, tool mobility arthroplasty until recently. And the idea was that with the double, like in the hip, with the double, the dual mobility, the dislocation risk would be a lot lower, especially in the first few months where the dislocation happened. And then came the conical spheres that you can also, um, the trunked conical spheres that you can also screw. We're coming back to that. And this is uh, Dr. Luciez and uh, Dr. Tessier that developed the touch and the Maya that are the last dual mobility implants uh, with the movies, main used ones. So what's the rationale and advantages of um, the ball and socket dual mobility implant arthroplasty? Well, it has been described quite good in uh, the article by um, Dwerings and Verstraken that uh, moving from a saddle joint to a ball and socket joint, well, is not that problematic, even though it disagrees with the anatomy. And here are the authors. Well, dual mobility uh, seems to uh, solve a lot of problems, especially in revision with dislocation and loosening of the cup. It restores thumb length in the alignment of the thumb, corrects the Z deformity better than any other intervention that we have uh, for the CMC1 osteoarthritis, giving a better cosmesis and a better function. The recovery is quite shorter and the key pinch can be even higher than the opposite side, especially if there is already osteoarthritis um, after the surgery than before, up to 111 or 112%. There is a low revision rate with the new implants. However, we don't have um, a follow-up that's long enough to be sure of those numbers that are going uh, obviously to rise and the complications are quite minor. So we're going to talk about that in a few moments. And we have satisfactory revision options. When a CMC joint arthroplasty with dual mobility doesn't work, you have a list of options that we're going to uh, talk about later. And a small and quick word about midcarpal instabilities. Well, when you have a midcarpal instability, a trapeziectomy can destabilize the corpus a little bit more and is then not the ideal solution. Well, like every surgery, there is disadvantages. Well, first of all, it's technically demanding. 
So you cannot just start doing trapez um, trapezium metacarpal uh, dual mobility arthroplasties like that in your own in your own surgery room and stating, okay, well, there is a learning curve that has been stated as up to 30 cases by the article I said. There is a cost for that. And well, again, the learning curve is quite steep. It's 30 cases, it's not like 10 or 20 cases. 30 cases can be more than a year of surgery for, for a surgeon starting these interventions. And well, it can cost you a lot in the beginning, especially if you try implanting the arthrolysis, it doesn't work. Well, like said one of my former masters, choosing your surgery is choosing your complication. And well, here are the key points I think that are uh, common to all of the surgeries, whatever the arthroplasty you're using, as long as it's dual mobility. Well, you have to get, have a good approach of the trapezium and metacarpal. 80% of the surgeon reports using a dorsal approach, even though there is also the Wagner or Geda Mobert approach, that's um, Palmer. And if you use a dorsal approach, be aware that the sensitive branch of the radial nerve is not very far away from where you're working. We're going to come back to that later. Metacarpal exposure is of tremendous importance. You have to liberate your uh, metacarpal, the basis of the metacarpal, and the cut, well, depends a bit on the kind of arthroplasty you use, but don't be shy with your cut. If you need to see the trapezium well, well cut your metacarpal. And you need to have a progressive rasping, like we do in hip arthroplasty, actually. And the thing is not to have the biggest implant in place is to have the best fit. We're going to talk about that later also. Trapezium preparation. Well, once you've done the, the metacarpal, the trapezium, if your exposure is correct, is now the most important, I think, in my own personal opinion, the most important step in the surgery because most of the complications and the revisions especially come from that, uh, from that step. Then after preparing the trapezium, I like to use uh, a trial implant before implanting the, the glass component uh, for this particular part with the neck, straight, angulated. I usually use the best fit and you have to have a good passive and maybe active stability and a correct ligamentation. Not active and uh, not tensioned enough or too tensioned is the first step to complications and revisions. That's why I think that fluoroscopy assessment should always, or at least as long as you have not reached the top of your learning curve, be used during the surgery, some key steps, and after the surgery, meaning before closing. And this is how you end up. There is a variation of technique. I personally use the wallet as many times as I can, and as soon as I can, well, there is a usual advantage that has been described with Don Lalonde, by Don Lalonde, that there is no tourniquet pain, minimal anesthetic risk, no prolonged, uh, no prolonged impairment of the limb. Uh, no, pro you can prolong the anesthesia with a catheter. It's lower cost. You don't need an anesthesiologist, and it's maximal cost effectiveness uh, regarding the surgery. And well, a little surgical feel quite can help a lot. This is as described by Larson in uh, 2021. A few other teams. The first, um, the first report of Wallant uh, for trapezic uh, for uh, dual mobility arthroplasty um, dates back to 2016. So it's almost seven or eight or eight years ago. So Wallant allows you also, and that's my favorite part about it, um, with this, uh, the arthroplasty to intraoperative testing, active and passive stability can be uh, evaluated with that uh, with that anesthesiology uh, technique. Well, you can see if your implant fits, if it's stable during motion, in opposition, abduction, abduction, flexion, extension. Well, and once you're close the skin, your patient can have a look and with that look, see how mobile his thumb is. Setting those goals, because the scar is certainly going to uh, try to prevent and is going to, uh, to stiff a little bit more the joint. But it is good also for clinical research. Well, if you want to see how does work the thumb in active motion, well, that's, your, that's your shot. 
And as an expert, a little bit of medical legal issue, even if I don't think that's going to generalize any soon. Well, if your patient comes like two or three months later being completely stiff, you can tell him, well, look, you didn't move. This is the exposure you get with Wallant and with the mobility. I don't know if the video is going to work. Nope. So uh, I'm going to just show it this way. And this is how it happens in the OR. So the patient moves freely. And if you get a close up to the implant, well, it's stable. No movement. It's quite good, actually. And well, if it doesn't fit, you just change the implant. So that's the important part about testing it with the wallet anesthesia. So the dual mobility prosthesis, how do we do it? What are the pearls and pitfalls that you have to respect if you want to have good results? Well, the metacarpal beak resection appeared uh, after the first generations uh, that allow the patient to, to avoid uh, conflict between the base of the metacarpal and the trapezium, especially if you have heterotopic ossification, scar tissue that can, I mean, prevent the mobility there. The best fit is not the best fit. If you feel your metacarpal too much and there is a contact between the stem and the cortical bone of the thumb, well, stress shielding is going to happen or is at least more likely to. And the forces are not distributed the same manner, homogeneous manner that you would have with the best fit. Also, during the surgery, you expose yourself to some complication as a metacarpal fracture. Surgery is not quite the same. And well, the other thing that you have to respect is a trapezium. Most of the complications are coming from the trapezial side. The metacarpal is a little bit more forgiving. The one rule that everybody agrees on is your six millimeter uh, cup diameter is at least six millimeters. So you have to have at least six millimeters of bone. Otherwise you're exposing yourself to a lot of complication. There is a debate between six and eight millimeters, depending if you're an expert or not, but we're coming to that later. The osteophyte resection, well, not everybody agrees how to do it, but one of the things that more than 80% of the surgeons agree around the world is that we have to take out at least the ulnar steel fight. So as someone who is beginning the surgery of TMC dual mobility arthroplasty, I think that the fluoroscopy is your best friend. You need to have a centered cup and you need to put it in a manner that the past line, that's the articular line between the the scaphoid and the trapezium or proximal um, proximal part of the trapezium, well, you have to be, your cup has to be parallel to it. And well, even if some um, teams like Duco uh, has said that, you can see it on this diagram, the shape of the trapezium on, uh, on the profile view can be a little bit uh, inclinated. I think seven degrees is not the most important thing. If you have to Remember something and remember one rule about the cup is that it has to be parallel to the past point. One of the interesting concepts that uh, have been published last year uh, by uh, Jushi and Trabelsi is uh, the M1, M2 metacarpal arch, stating that a good arthroplasty and better results can be achieved if you respect the arch between M1 and M2. That's coming back to giving good length. That's how you do uh, the imaging about preoperatively and then during the surgery to have an idea about how is that arch. So what's the clinical results of those arthroplasty? What can you tell your patient? Well, um, a lot of studies have been um, published. However, the last studies, like the one by Chu uh, Kurujian in uh, 2023 with 240 TMC included between 2002 and 2020, so with at least two years of follow-up and much more, um, had stated that 94% of the patient, working patient, went back to work within the six, weeks, the six first weeks. You don't have that kind of result with trapeziectomy, or at least not that high. Complication rate was 7.5%, and survival rate was 20, 97%. Remstrup followed the movies with at least two years of follow-up. 
complication rate, close to 20%, but prosthetic revision during the two years, only 3%. We're quite far away from 27%. Well, we're not 10 years delay, but even the first design didn't have as low as those uh, arthroplasties. The touch with uh, Bruno Luciez again that published um, his uh, results uh, with good uh, 9% only uh, complication, half of them being the curve antinocinovitis and the other one being um, trigger thumb, and only 4.6% of revision and 95% of, of uh, satisfaction. So choosing your surgery is choosing your complication, and thus your revision. According to the series, depending on the kind of the arthroplasty you're using and the generation of it, 7 to 25% of complication. The most um, frequent ones being the decalvantinotinovitis, the radial nerve, the radial sensory nerve branch irritation, and the trigger thumb. Well, nothing very, uh, very harmful, we'll say. And 3 to 25% of revision, excluding the one of the caffeine, of course. The deep infections, well, are quite exceptional. It's difficult to see that. Polyethylene weir. Well, polyethylene became reticulated. As we said, with the double mobility, less th there is less and less. And what we saw from a lot of studies, especially the one from the team of Montpellier with Professor Chamas, is that there is a five-year cutoff. That's when the complication really start to appear. And that's why we need a lot more follow-up of our patients, even with the new generation of implants. Well, this is the loosening of the cup. And this is an x-ray after the complete loosening of another patient. And the carpal osteotomy can be used sometimes, especially in the first design. Here you see in a uh, second generation of the caffeine, and you see that the metacarpal has to had to extract the, the cemented stem. With the old generation, the single mobilities, the dislocation rate has been advocated to be happening in the three first years. If you didn't have this location at three years, well, you were out of trouble, at least for that complication. One particular uh, complication is the trapezium fracture. It's not very common, I would say exceptional, but doesn't make you happy. Uh, Jean Gobo and his team, uh, they studied the ivory, um, the ivory implant, this single, mo a single mobility implant with more than 10 year follow-up. And well, from other studies, What's obvious is that there is a zone that is at risk that's more lateral in the trapezium. And most of them happen for technical errors, bad centering. Well, again, I advise you to use fluoroscopy, implantation technique, bone stock quality. If you're in the gray zone between six and eight millimeters and you're impacting your cup a little bit too much, well, that's how you can find. But the thing is, well, even if that happened, you can always convert to a trapeziectomy, or like on the X-ray we're seeing, well, you can try your best and have good results with uh, with those uh, procedures. What are the options about revision? Well, same implant revision. You just take the same and you start again with a bigger cup or a bigger stem, depending on where the problem is. Longer neck, if tension was not good enough. Shorter neck, if there is too much tension. You can also try different implant revision. Usually, has been described also. And one of the other solution, and there is very few reports about it in, this, in the literature, is the scaphometacarpal implant. Well, I think there is also a team that tried the metacarpal stem in the scaphoid and the cup in the metacarpal. Well, we need more follow up to know what's the real results. Um, of this. Trapeziectomy is the last one, uh, one of the last ones, and suspensioplasty can work too. Here we have some, an example of both. Another point to take in consideration is STT osteoarthritis. So um, that's one of the treatments you can have if you have really predominant STT. Truth is, Muir and his team they said that STT and TMC osteoarthritis combined are four times higher than STT osteoarthritis alone. Mark Garcia Elias, that I had the pleasure to learn from, 
said that they were totally unrelated. It's like having shoulder and knee osteoarthritis. Well, it can be a common basis, but you can have one or the other without being without having a real connection between them. The trapezium, he thought, was he thinks I think, as it has a cantilever effect with the metacarpal, as the STT is more of an articulation between the first and second row. That's why it has a role in corporal uh, osteoarthritis. And well, one of the former teachers also, Professor Robert, stated that 80 to 90% of his patients coming from with pain with radiologic STT and TMC osteoarthritis treated only by TMC solving with various procedures, including the arthroplasty, 80 to 90% of them were satisfied and didn't complain of pain after that. So out of 100 patients, just 10 to 20 of them are going to have a gesture on the, on the STT osteoarthritis, and they're going to be happy with it. Well, last June in uh, Remini, we, uh, with the group colleagues, experienced uh, a questionnaire and we uh, gave it to too, too many surgeons and we sent it to several uh, hand surgery society and 203 surgeons from four different continents answered it. Nine, uh, 59 of them were highly experienced according to Jean Boutang, which the definition is 10 years of experience with the surgery and more than 20 surgery uh, a year. 92 of them were French. And what we noticed, and this data is not published yet, it's in progress, a huge variability, very huge variability in techniques amongst surgeons, amongst surgeon experience or not, amongst surgeons French or not. And there is a lot of variability. But what we kind of all of agree on, uh, agree on, and we have more than 80% of uh, answers going that way, is that the KWAR centering for the cup placement is, is of tremendous importance. Osteophytes resection especially the ulnar one. And well, as we already said in our studies, the De Carvin and the uh, sensitive branch of the radial nerve irritation are the most common and most commonly reported complication. On a global level, out of the 203 surgeons, trapeziectomy was the most common revision procedure. But the thing is that we still need studies because of this variability. We don't know if, well, what's the best solution for revision? What's the best solution if you have a trapezium uh, fracture? What's the best solution regarding the uh, opening of the capsule? What's the best solution about the, the Carvin? Do we prevent it? Yes, no. Well, all of this has not been, and it's a very big field to be, to be doing research on. Well, if you want to focus a bit more on the 22, uh, on the 192, sorry, uh, French surgeons, well, there is some difference. As I stated, STT osteoarthritis is less uh, a problem for the French. As I said with Professor Robert, we don't uh, take into account only the radiology. Well, symptomatology also is different and clinics um, allows you to differentiate from the pain of the TMC and the pain from the STT. And well, 80 to 90% of satisfaction. French never use general anesthesia or at least the one who answered the questionnaire. Um, for TMC osteoarthritis, five to ten percent, more or less, uh, are using Wallent on a regular basis. Seventy-six percent of the patient complaining of uh, osteoarthritis of the TMC joint, a dual mobility arthroplasty. Well, there is a bias. All the surgeons that answered. The quarter percent of the patients were getting a TMC arthroplasty with dual mobility when they came for French, one of the 92 French surgeons uh, for osteoarthritis. So it's very uh, important to state also that age was not a contraindication, whether very young, but especially very old patients are still getting a TMC dual mobility arthroplasty. And well, the most uh, common procedure for revision in the French population of surgeons was not the trapeziectomy. In fact, it was the revision to the same implant, putting a bigger cup, bigger stem. Well, and that's where it's it's uh, it's interesting. So, in conclusion, this is a fifty years odyssey, inspired by other articulation, 
like the hip or the shoulder sometimes. It's a new tool that you have in your arsenal to treat your patient that became original and independent through the years with its own complication. It's a revolution in a way. And it solves the painful thump, giving a stable one, strong one, and with reversion option. That's not exactly the topic of today, but trapeziectomy doesn't allow these options. There's a lot of studies. However, they have a really short follow-up. The last generation of implant have a follow-up from published follow-up from two to three years. And that's not sufficient enough. As we saw, five years is the cutoff. And well, the thing is, the implant design, the implant evolution is going much more faster than the length needed to study the result of this. That's why we need more clinical studies and well, to look closely at the evolution of the designs and the result of this evolution. I think that the complication is something we have to monitor and we have to report. But once we understand the problem and we treat the cause, like the dual mobility did with dislocation, because there was no dislocation in this series with three years of follow-up with the touch, no dislocation in three years, meaning that we had the cutoff of three years dislocation period. And I think the future is that this is going to become the first line of treatment for our patient, or is likely to be. And thus, we're going to have a lot of revision surgery, like this one. And a surgeon that wants to strike TMC arthroplasty has also to be aware that he will have to treat with revision and complications. And well, as all of the other arthroplasties, robots, technology, mixed reality, planning, 3D softwares, mobility arthroplasty. Here are the references I use. Uh, thank you, Mehdi. Mehdi, can you stop sharing, please? Mehdi, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, thank yeah. you, Mehdi. I think that's it, right? And that's it. I don't know where I did stop if I could finish the conclusion, but yes, that's yes, it. Sure. I just put the pages of the reference. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mary. You can stop sharing. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Sorry Mary. Sorry about the this. connection issues. No worries. Uh, thank you, Mary, for this uh, enlightening presentation on uh, TMC joint arthroplasty. Let's do a short uh, Q&A. Uh -huh. uh, now, Mehdi, what about patient selection when you do a CMC joint orthoplasty? Because there are a lot of, historically, there have been a lot of options, right? Hemi, tra tra yeah. trapeziectomy, the LRTI, CMC joint fusion, and even the implant orthoplasty. So how do you select the ideal patient for this particular procedure? Well, the truth is when a patient comes to my office with uh, a TMC arthroplasty or even if it's not isolated with STT uh, osteoarthritis, sorry, and even if it's with the STT osteoarthritis, I always talk to them about the different options. The thing is that unless it's a heavy manual worker, I don't think that uh, arthrodesis is a good option. And the truth is I already implanted TMC arthroplasty in a heavy manual worker and it works well, well, the follow-up I have is like three or four years, but till now, so far, no problems. And other uh, other teams, like the one of Chukodian, they also published that they implanted uh, with heavy manual walkers. And they have, well, they use the arthroplasty a lot more than that. But I, I think I, I counsel all of my patients that the arthroplasty for me now is the first line of treatment. Trapeziectomy is becoming for me a, a revision surgery, actually. And as I stated, I don't have uh, revisions in my series for now, but I know it's going to come in the coming years, um, to happen in the coming years. I think the revision of the implant revision is even better than trapeziectomy. If you're able to revise your implant, if you have enough bone stock or with a little graft of uh, bone, all of the patient, unless 
triplets. And only contraindication uh, I observe, unless you don't have a minimum trapezium height. Uh, I saw a patient last uh, month with uh, a trapezium that was four millimeter high and like it looked like uh, like an implant, you know, it was very flat. So you cannot implant that. I'm not a big fan of scaphometacarpal uh, arthroplasties as the distal scaphoid is not very famous for uh, its bone quality. And I think it's, I prefer trapeziectomy uh, done well uh, than than just trying to put an implant in the, in the scaphoid, the distal scaphoid, whether reversed or normal. Uh, thank you, Mehdi. Uh, what about inflammatory arthritis as a primary diagnosis, say rheumatoid or some form of inflammatory arthritis? If that is a first diagnosis, you still would go with an implant arthroplasty? Uh, could you repeat the question? I didn't hear the first part of it. Yeah. Uh, what about the diagnosis? Would your treatment change if the diagnosis is, is an inflammatory arthritis, say a rheumatoid? Actually, no. Actually, no. I think uh, on the opposite, they're they're really good patient for it. Like for the other arthroplasties, uh, like shoulder or knee or hip, they are patients that are used to be uh, to be painful. Even if we see a lot less than our masters used to see because of the improvement of treatments, uh, the medical treatment of uh, rheumatoid arthritis. But uh, on the opposite, well, the only thing that's quite different with the hand is that you have to take into account the deformation of. Uh, the deformation of your of your thumb of your thumb column. It's, it's if it's very very deformed, you have to discuss with your patient the high probability of revision. But if the deformation is not that high, which is I what we mainly see today, because thanks to the treatments of uh, of um, inflammatory arthritis, I counsel my patient to get the CMC uh, replacement too. Thank you, Mehdi. And Mehdi, what about the different designs you mentioned? There is, I mean, you mentioned about Electra, the movies, the touch. So what has been the trend? It trend is towards dual mobility? Well, uh, all of the all of the designers and the manufacturers are kind of using the commercial argument that the double mobility is better, even though if we don't have the follow-up, the numbers are speaking from themselves, we have less complication at the two or three years cut off than we used to have with the single mobility. So I personally think whenever I can use a double mobility, I use a double mobility. I think the last single mobility I implanted was like two or three years ago. Uh, the thing is, well, uh, when we did our little survey uh, about the 203 surgeon, one trend is uh, obvious. The leader on the market is Kerry with the touch. They have more or less give or take and half of the of the market. Um, and that depends on, well, the survey is not 100% representative. We didn't ask all of the hand surgeon using that implant. But well, 203 surgeon over the world is quite, is quite impressive already and can give you an idea. So I think they have half of the market. The second position of the people who answered is the Maya from Lepin. And well, the third position is uh, the movies. And uh, they share the other half of the of the market, uh, the Maya being a bit more uh, used. Another bias in that study is that, well, 92% of the respondents were French. So I think those numbers are more representing the French number than the international number, but both are not very far from one another, I think. And uh, thank you, Mary, for that. And Mary, I was just looking at one of the data from the movies group and found that one of the significant uh, complication risk was having a nickel allergy. So someone who has a nickel allergy, uh, because even in uh, implants like a uh, joint suite, talk about nickel allergy, right? And one of them discussed that, okay, in the movie's design, the, the presence of nickel was slightly higher and you should always counsel or ask patients where they have nickel allergy. Well, I think that's a problem that can happen with any arthroplasty, and designers are quite aware of that because a lot of them, um, a lot of uh, the industry is aware that there is a nickel allergy, or and using the commercial uh, the commercial advantage of having proposing a. a, a arthroplasties that are without nickel and without any other allergen. And well, I think, I'm not sure, but I think the Maya is uh, nickel-free, uh, if I'm not wrong. 
And well, I'm sure the designer are going to go that way because that happens with knee, that happens with shoulder, that happens with hip. Uh, it's very, very exceptional, but not that exceptional. It's just that I think we did not pay attention enough for that. But one of the reasons of the complication, yes, can be that. Thank you, we have to be aware of that. And that's why we have to, impl I mean, if your patient have signs of allergy, you might need to consider what's the main component in your metal alloy in the head of your, in the head and the neck of your prestige. Uh, thank you, Mehdi. Mehdi, I think that's all the questions that we have for this session. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. And I'm sure this is going to reach to a lot of people. Thank you very much for the invitation. And it's my pleasure. Bye-bye. Goodbye.